You're listening to 17 Karat K-Pop. For more information about the variety of topics covered on this show, as well as my other podcast, How to Stan, visit 17karatkpop.weebly.com. And if you enjoy this episode, please consider becoming a monthly donor to support my work and allow it to continue to go on and be free for all to access for as low as 99 cents a month. Visit the Support the Show link on my site's homepage for more information. Hello everybody, and welcome back to 17 Karat K-Pop. It's time for the monthly countdown of the top 20 best J-pop and K-pop releases of the past month. Plus, at the end of the show, stay tuned for lots of honorable mentions to shout out. The usual caveats apply to this episode. If your favorite is not included... I apologize, there are only 20 slots, I can't get to everyone's fave. I listen to literally hundreds of new releases from hundreds of different artists every single month. So, But I try to think best about what comebacks stand out in an objective, music critic mindset way. Production value, vocals, aesthetics, originality, etc. So remember, it's about the music as objectively as I can possibly review it based on a host of different variables. So, all right, without further ado, let's get to the countdown. Here is my pick for number 20, Overworld, with a pair of singles that came off an EP called Namely. This pair of singles is very, very distinct and memorable. Living It Up has this rapping, singing style, and these growly choruses I wasn't expecting. And equally fun and quirky is the song Namely, which has a funky electronic breakdown in the bridge, and this really good vocal delivery because it's emotion-filled, but not overkill. They deliver their message minus melodrama, but then they crank it up a notch and give fun melodrama for living it up, which is Pretty apt given the song title. 19 is Ghost 9 with the album Now When We Are In Love and the new single Up All Night. This is a very light and fun summary release. These guys basically went full Casper the Friendly Ghost and it is just so fun. The songs are also thematic. The trampoline song feels like it would be the perfect soundtrack to jumping on a trampoline. Up All Night sounds like a fun song for a summer sleepover. They just have very mood-setting summer hangout music here, as well as just really, really fun, colorful visuals to go with this release. Both the official Up All Night video and a bonus video to go with the introduction. Number 18, 2PM's new album, Must, and the video for Make It. They are still classic 2pm, yet also very grown up. They look very sharp in their suits, mature in sound, very mature, and it's really interesting to see after so much time without a 2pm comeback. The piano and saxophone intro blend seamlessly into the first full track on the album, and the album continues to have a perfect flow between songs. They show off their vocal skills, as well as bring back classic 2PM attention-grabbing storytelling in their new music video. And my favorite thing about this release has got to be the acoustic version of My House, a K-pop classic if there ever was one. It's the end of the world around them. Fire, meteor showers, it's the apocalypse. Meanwhile, these guys are acting clueless and still trying to flirt with this girl the whole time amidst the chaos. It is the This Is Fine meme in music video form. And I think it's no coincidence that the main girl they're flirting with has a yellow dress that looks a lot like the one in La La Land. So it's overall classic goofiness and memorableness from 2PM. But they are also all grown up in other ways. Number 17, twice with their new album, Taste of Love and the single Alcohol Free. Like Monster X did this month, it's really cool as a longtime fan to see Twice have more mature songs. And my personal favorite is probably Scandal, with the whispers and the bass line. 
just so many elements of that song combined to make for a really impressive new song from them. But it is a nice organic growth we see because it's not like they totally abandoned their cutesy youthful image. They're just maturing naturally and that makes for great music. And it has these really interesting visuals in the music video where you see kind of optical illusions in a way of the members in different sizes, of zooming into eyes to see a different world through their eyes, literally. Really hard to explain, but visually just very captivating video for the title track, Alcohol Free. Number 16, EXO's Don't Fight the Feeling. As I have said before on the show recently and in the episode called Don't Fight the Feeling, it's really great for longtime XOLs to see this band get a break from all of the drama that comes with being superheroes. This time, their characters in their music video universe get to take a break from the fighting and act like quote-unquote normal humans on Earth, as opposed to the parallel universe. So they really lighten things up, both in their music video and, I think, in their songs overall, which have not stripped-back instrumentals, if you compare it to a bunch of artists, but for EXO specifically, I would consider them relatively stripped back instrumentals, less background noise going on to let their voices stand out and mellow things out again relatively. Some notable B-sides, No Matter is a perfect example of how EXO have managed to make what sounds like computer game music somehow sound way cooler. Runaway is also a standout to me that I think would sound incredible live. If not an acoustic version, we need at least a live version someday. Number 15, Brave Girls with Summer Queen and the music video for Chimat Baram. I am so happy for Brave Girls, the attention that is overdue and well-deserved. And they know it too, which I love even more. Rather than just humbly step back onto the scene after their song had resurfaced popularity, but actually owning it and saying, yeah, we are those queens, by naming their album Summer Queen, and then of course hearing them say, B-Girls are back in She Matt Baram was so exciting to hear, because yes, they are, and they are bold about it. I also love that the music video for that title track is every type of summer K-pop comeback at once. They didn't just go to the skate park or a car wash or the beach or the office or a night party with dancing. No, they went everywhere. And then a disco party in a different music video. Number 14, Ace with Siren Dawn and the music video for Higher. Even if you had not listened to a second of the new album yet, just the music video and The concept photos ought to have piqued your interest and drawn you to this comeback. I love that Ace is going back to these underwater mermen-style photo shoots and leaning into this unique princely underwater world meets outer space meets royalty aesthetic. Very, very unique combination, hard to explain, but they're really crafting their own distinct fashion sense for their musical personas. Their wardrobe choices include everything from chokers to sparkly clothes to a pearl lip ring. Really stunning. The visuals of the whole higher music video are equally stunning. The one disappointment I guess I have with the video is that it does not talk about or address the fact that Byungwon threw out a potential hint at a deeper theme fans could theorize over their work by saying a through line is throwing the dice, but there was no dice to pay attention to in this video. Unless he meant it not literally seeing dice, but more about taking a gamble in life. Which maybe is what they're still alluding to in their work, given that the intro to this album is the instrumental Misere Medu. The message the composer sends in the theme of That psalm, Psalm 51, is basically asking for mercy, begging for forgiveness from sin. That makes sense when considering the concept trailer for this comeback is when Byung-Gwan says, quote, It is during our darkest moments 
that we must focus to see the light. So we must focus on what we need forgiveness for in order to receive that forgiveness. So they're coming to terms with the consequences they need to face, and they mix that heavy thing with other intriguing layers to their story through, again, the people, aesthetics, and more. One more fun fact about this release. Featured heavily in the album credits is Mad Fresh, who worked on one of Ace's best songs ever, Cactus, and Twice's Touchdown, which is one of their best b-sides, if you ask me. Number 13, Haru with 15. Haru has such a unique voice that none of his songs are boring, honestly, but this one is particularly good. The way he delivers lines, where they're kind of rolling on top of each other in almost a rapping singing way, kind of like Alessia Cara or even some early Zara Larson songs like Ain't My Fault, do that thing where they're not rapping, but it's almost matching the cadence of rapping. And he does that yet again here, albeit in a slowed down way. It makes sense if you listen to it and his other work. And this one just, again, lets his voice shine and echo and carry the meaning of the song very effectively. Number 12, and flying Man on the Moon in the music video for Moonshot. The video for Moonshot has so many fun and quirky and unexpected surprises, from the funhouse style setting to the beautiful images of a moon and the night sky. There's just a lot to look at visually and take in. While you listen to a catchy pump-up song about if you want to change, be not afraid, is the repeated line. If you want to change, be not afraid. There are some fun surprises in the structure of the song too. Wasn't expecting the second verse to be a rap like that. The chanting at the end really brings home, again, the message, if you want to change, be not afraid. You can reach the moon if you miss you'll land among the stars. The album's b-sides also offer a lot of fun quirky surprises. They really get to show off their vocal skill on Ask. They get to hit some good high notes there. There's a more dramatic sound they go for in Comma. Then they're back to more fun and playful sounds in Undo and You. And then they slow things down for Zip to You and later on Flashback. So it's quite a good variety of songs. Number 11, Bam Bam, with the music video and debut solo album, both called Ribbon. Honestly, when I first heard about Bam Bam going solo, I expected basically a bunch of rap songs, or kind of this rap talk style, which he does have at times, but this new mini album has a lot more range on it than I was expecting, which was a really fun surprise. A lot of cute and light and fun pop songs, plus some rapping, R&B influences, and then it ends with a ballad. So, excuse the pun, but he really ties up his intro to Bam Bam the Solo Artist in a nice bow. So it's a present to have this gift that keeps on giving with its variety. The music video is honestly one of my favorites of the year so far. It is so pretty and a pastel wonderland. I kind of want a mini movie, with the location being the ribbon music video setting. In that wonderland, I would love to have Bam Bam perform a live version of every song off the album. So it's both a really cute and quirky and pastel aesthetic filled comeback. Just so much fun. He also gives me some, some vibes of Kyle and singers like Kyle who have this truly authentic, happy-go-lucky attitude that feels like anything but an act. A super authentic, good vibes allowed only nature. Number 10 is The Artist From 20, with his new pair of singles and the music video for Radio Will Sing Our Song. His first pair of singles we talked about in the Best of May episode. It's really impressive this early on in his career to already have this very specific to him sound. So he continues to lean into this super synth heavy sound for his songs as well as this writing style that mixes very specific situational details with universally relatable lyrics. It's a great blend of the personal and the universal. 
overall just really high quality, catchy songs that are characteristic to him, which is really impressive. The music video for Radio is also can't miss material. It's really emotional to watch because as he sings about wishing the relationship could last, but knowing that it can't, you see the memories of good dates and sweet nights with his with someone he used to be in a relationship with. And so it's very wistful and nostalgic for those good old days before a relationship went sour or a relationship had to end in a very, very sad way. And then he's singing about, at least the radio will always sing our song. So if we can't dance to it together anymore, at least the radio will preserve that special moment in time. Number nine, Toku with the album Bouquet. Toku is a member of the Japanese duo Garni Delia, but he's definitely doing his own thing on this new release. He still has some of Garni Delia's sonic influences, but he also shows his own colors. His solo music has proven through this new album that his music is perfectly situated in the middle of a Venn diagram of anime rock, pop punk, electropop, and like 10 other genres. It's really eclectic. And I love how much he leans into this extravagant, unique, quirky persona. Number eight, Stray Kids. For all of their varied releases this past month, Han Solo single Happy, the subunit song and video for Up All Night, and the mixtape track O. Even without an official packed comeback this month, Stray Kids has been so busy. First of all, their song Up All Night is a subunit song with Bang Chain, Chanbin, Soonmin, and Felix, and it brings us Halloween in summer. Really, really fun, monsters esque, goofy, not too creepy video, so it's just a bunch of fun. It's a Halloween party type of video. The lyrics are such a mood about not sleeping and being too caffeinated. In some ways, hear me out on this, doesn't it sound like Machne on Top given a Halloween remix? Or some sort of distorting the Machne on Top instrumental? I'm just saying, the undercurrent is there. They also released the track Mixtape O, which was a very fun surprise. Lastly, Han released a new song called Happy, which is a really emotional song about wishing a loved one the best, and hoping they are happier now, and coming to terms with the fact you have to let them go and move on. You know, his last solo release was called Close, inspired by the film Closer, and so I wonder if this one was also inspired by the romance in a movie. Number seven is Pink Fantasy, with their new album Alice in Wonderland, and the music video for Poison. This group, through this new comeback, is definitely making sure that the comparisons they get to Dreamcatcher can only go so far. They really are not much like Dreamcatcher. Sound-wise, sure, it's very pop-punk, gothic, princess, aesthetics, etc. But they really are doing their own thing with this sub-genre of K-pop. They have this very industrial rock vibe, really hardcore guitar on their new title track, Poison. Shout out to the guitarist Jun Mo for that. Plus, they have a really unique music video wardrobe with inspo for days, from the dark lipsticks to the Cruella de Vil hairdo to the glittery tears, an anti-prom vision board. Number six, Ha Sun Woon, with the album and music video, Sneakers. Ha Sun Woon is always a delight, but he is truly next level adorable here. Sneakers is such a fun video and song. Basically, after he wears his magic sneakers, he gets transported to the fields and woods he had images of on his vision board of sorts. It's a really cute story. Find that right pair of shoes, lace up your magic sneakers, and you can feel like you can conquer the world. It is just such a fun, bouncy, happy song. Plus, there is lots of adorable sneaker design inspo. As for the B-sides on this album, I was a bit surprised at how many slower songs were on there. But that's not a bad thing because it proves that 
you can have a naturally very high voice, and in that higher register there is still a lot of room for versatility. And he gets to show off his vocal skill by showing off some variety in his delivery, even with his very specific register. Number five, Luna with their album and and the music video for PTT, aka Paint the Town. I will get into decoding and theory mode and review the album much more in depth on the new episode of Lunaverse Talk coming your way very soon. But until then, what I will point out about this new release are a few details I love about it. One is, of course, seeing Hassel back. Two is the Easter eggs like another close-up of white sneakers and the circle of flames. We'll get more into that in that Lunaverse Talk episode. The empowering song Dance on My Own is a personal favorite. And lastly, I love that they do have variety in their sound. This new album sounds very distinct from their previous releases and in ways that make sure the visual components are not so distracting that you forget about their impressive raw talent. They get time to really just let their vocals shine more than usual on some lower tempo songs on this album. So really appreciate that chance for them to remind us they're not just a performance group, they are a top tier vocal group as well. Number four, Nissy, with the new single and music video for Do Do. First of all, the song itself is pop perfection. It has that artful use of auto-tune I'm always going on about. Yes, there is an artful way to do it. It's a cool electronic and pop sound. Just super catchy and sing-along ready. I can't get it out of my head lately. And he just looks so cute. He looks like he's having a blast in the video. It's a refreshing thing to see given his dire straits he was in in previous music videos. But there is a bit of that continuation. So storyline-wise, this video picks up where previous ones left off. Remember, in the video for Get You Back, Nissy seemed to have an evil spirit possessing him, and he was kind of glitching in and out of the scene. There were 3D images around him. Some sort of mirage world. Something is playing tricks on him. He was in a seemingly haunted woods, and then in the Say Yes storyline, he falls out of the sky during a lightning strike, falls into a forest, sees a bathtub in this clearing, and the video ends where he is curled up in the bathtub, clutching a necklace. Now in this new mini-movie of a video, it's around eight minutes long, the video starts with a woman just going about her day doing dishes and stuff, and then suddenly gets freaked out because water stains are appearing on the ceiling above her. Because when lightning strikes again, guess who somehow teleports into that bathtub? Nissy, who gets out of the water and is trying to figure out where is he now? Where has he been transported by some evil force, I guess? He walks into the living room and then there's this long story short psychedelic montage of sorts, moments where he's hanging out in a 3D world full of colors and this daydream about him performing at a sold-out concert. Watching our two little kids watching the live stream, sitting in front of their TV and in front of a coffee table that happens to have a toy car on it. And their mom appears to be the person who, whose house just got wrecked by the lightning strike that transported Nissy into her house. Then we realize it's sort of a dream within a dream. When he snaps out of the daydream, he's back in that living room with a necklace scene hanging up nearby. Then we see him wake up a second time. So it is like a dream, a daydream within a night dream. At the very end of the video, he leaves the house and drives off in a car that looks an awful lot like the mini toy car on that coffee table earlier. Further blurring the picture of what's happening is the backstage version of this video. The alternate music video, which is much shorter, features a different ending where Nissy wakes up not in a random living room, but watching himself performing on a wall of security camera TV screens. 
If you're confused, you should be. His story is clearly far from over. This is just the latest chapter. And so you're left wondering, what was really a dream? Because if that show that was being live-streamed was not the real Nissi, and that wasn't real, then why did the car seem real? that was in that scene and at the end. Why the necklace continuity? Why the bathtub as a teleportation device? Is an evil spirit creating a clone of Nissi, inhabiting Nissi's body? Are the dream within a dream sequences all mind games being played on him? We're left to speculate, but that's part of the fun of his story. Number three, B.I. With his debut full-length, solo album, Waterfall. He really showed an impressive variety ranging from R&B to rapping to more down the middle pop songs. And I love that it starts with a song that goes hard with the rap and the beat to it. It is just so in your face saying, hello world, I'm ready for my solo. And then he ends with a finale song that's triumphant but not in the same way. More of a quiet, less in-your-face victory. Quiet symbolically. So you really go on quite the emotional journey through his album, and you go through those emotional waves even if you don't speak Korean. He really just delivers emotions that you feel when you're listening to a song that everyone understands what they're listening to is sad or confidence boosting or happy or whatever he just really taps into the human experience so it's a very human album that ebb and flow of complex human emotions and thoughts that he articulates show up even in the same song so he doesn't even move on to a different sound song to song but even within songs like stay for example the rapping goes off It's like he can't get the words out fast enough. But the chorus is somehow feels slower, like it's pulling him back. So it's an interesting push and pull effect as a result. He plays off of the instrumentals he's working with in really interesting, effective ways. So overall, a really cool encapsulation of who he plans to be as a soloist going forward. The lyric that really stuck with me and I think is worth sitting with most, out of many, is the phrase emotional anemia. Emotional anemia, war in my head, he says. Number two, Monsta X with one of a kind. First of all, it's really cool to see their maturity in several ways. Not only is the subject matter of their songs definitely more mature now, and they look very grown up in their suits in the Gambler video, but they also just show their increased experience when it comes to contributing to Monsta X's writing and producing. Juhani produced the title track Gambler. Hyunwan wrote the lyrics for Baby. Actually, every song on the new album was contributed to by at least one Monsta X member. So they really were very hands-on in the making of this album. Each song really is very well made. The production is just top-notch. The layered instrumentals and very full sound we expect from them is back, but they still mix things up for them, from the guitarist to the bossa nova, yet they have the same classic Monster X charms throughout the album, fan-favorite details throughout the album. I personally still freak out and get excited whenever Juhani and I am switch back and forth rapping. Those verses are always so in your face. Drum roll please for my number one favorite release of June 2021, which will shock you. 17 with their new album, Your Choice, and the music video for Ready to Love. I had a very in-depth reaction and review for this album on a recent episode of the show called 17 Talk Volume 5, as well as in an essay on the 17 Talk page of my site now called The Artistry of 17, which makes the case for more versatility and layers to 17's work than what meets the eye. Their discography truly has 
so many multitudes and they always impressively converge. The impact of powerful storytelling through choreography mixed with impactful, powerful storytelling through videos, through vocals, etc., all converging for their very impressive material. This release is another top-notch job that shows the many layers to Seventeen's storytelling and talent. Time to give shoutouts to a bunch of honorable mentions. First up, NCT 127's new song and video for Save. This song is for Samsung advertisements, so it is catchier than it has any right to be. I have similar conflicted feelings to what I was feeling when Kai starred in that short film with a dope soundtrack for the for basically the car infomercial. This song is just so such an electro pop dream. It has a dance break that is just perfect for NCT 127 in every single chorus. It's a dance break basically. There you go. They somehow made the case for less words in the chorus, more time to dance. I would of course be remiss not to Shout out the NCT Dream repackage Hello Future and their super, super adorable, upbeat, pick-me-up music video for the new song, which further gives me material to theorize over when it comes to their blurring of animated and physical worlds. We've talked about at length on the NCT Talk series of episodes. Next honorable mention, one and only with video chat. This song gives me major TXT vibes. Especially if you're a fan of Blue Orangeade or Angel or Devil, this song is definitely for you. It is super cute and catchy and has a super cute video with that video chat concept, naturally, and very easy to copy along dance moves because you just use hand motions. So you can have a fun wholesome dance party virtually with your fellow J-pop fans. Next shout out goes to Yugium with his debut solo album, Point of View You. And is it just me or is it incredibly satisfying and exciting in a weird way to watch someone who had to be super clean cut and present this good boy image to the world play a bad boy on screen? There's something I really, really love about that. Even if his character in his new music videos is going through the ringer, he's really creating his own cinematic videos that leave me excited to see what comes next. Hoshi's new song, Power, super, super cute and very Hoshi of him, sounding simultaneously more mature and then immature at the same time in a good way. He's clearly very in touch with his inner child still and his inner tiger that he likes to talk about. The J-Rock group Passcode has a new live album out. It's called Strive. It's from their 2021 tour at the Toyosu Pit, so it's brand new. And if you want the perfect summation of all of the traits that make J-pop songs and J-Rock songs an acquired taste, the perfect summation is in Spark Ignition by Passcode. Truly a J-Rock masterpiece, but also the perfect encapsulation of the many layers that feel like too many layers to some listeners, maybe. It's heavy metal meets pop meets like five other genres, but it is so fast-paced, it is a thrill ride, and some people are overwhelmed by that rush of sound, feel like it's just this cacophony of noise. But when you get used to it, it is a blast to me. Jun Yan Hua has a new EP out with a beautiful cover of 10,000 Hours. Speaking of beautiful covers, the violinist O.M. Jamie just performed Butter by BTS on his violin. He has tons of BTS violin covers that are beautiful. And other K-pop and Western pop top 40 hits he's covered on the violin before, so make sure you check out OM Jamie wherever you stream music. Obviously, I have to give shoutouts to Taeyeon's latest SoundCloud releases, Swimming Pool and Rose. Lastly, the song RM released for BTS's Festa Celebrations, Bicycle. It definitely has the kind of vibe that would make it fit well on the mono mixtape of his. The noises in this song almost mimic bike pedals and bike wheels moving, so it helps easily visualize 
the bike riding he's sinning about. As for my favorite English language release from June, I love Tyler the Creator's new album, Call Me If You Get Lost. Because it is classic Tyler the Creator, his albums were always meant to be played start to finish in chronological order. Some people are confused, like, what is the big deal with this guy? Why the headlining status at festivals? And the reason people are scratching their heads actually kind of adds to the appeal of Tyler the Creator. Because his work is not necessarily the most accessible when it comes to when it comes to specific songs. If I sent someone a song from an artist and said, hey, you've got to check out this artist, I think you'd really like their work, they might say, yes, I'm into it, or no, I don't d dig that at all. But with Tyler, the creator, if you send someone one song of his off an album, they probably won't even know what to think of it. Because the best way to get someone into his music is actually saying, you just have to listen to the whole album. It's like recommending a TV show to someone and sending them episode 5 in the series. They may not know what to do with that. No loose ends tied up, so that's not satisfying. But also you missed all the exposition, all the build-up that would help inform your review of episode 5. Tell you the creator's projects are very distinct in that way. And very genre-defying, really unique storytelling that is very much his storytelling. No one else could pull off the weird genre defiance that he does. That wraps up today's episode in the countdown. For a full playlist of the music videos and the songs that I talked about today, including the honorable mentions, those Spotify and YouTube playlists will be linked to in the article on my show's website, where I elaborate further and highlight different aspects of all the releases I talked about on the show today. If you go to 17 Karat K pop, Weebly.com, click more, and then blog in the drop-down menu. Thank you so much, as always, for listening to and supporting this show. Thank you all for listening, and I will talk to you all again very, very soon.